check, check. Okay, welcome back after the class. Before we went for our class, we were on page number 20 of uh, lesson one, a uh, code of honor for the online students. Um, the PDF copy of this book, Code of Honor, is on the stream page. You can access it from the stream page. Okay, uh, let's move on. So we are on page number 20. Uh, we need to fire up our passion for purity. Okay, we looked at this verse in 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, verses 19 and 20. You know, when we are people who are constantly cleansing our lives from what is impure, we become vessels of honor. Okay, we become the vessels of honor in God's house uh, where God can use us. We are ready for the master's use. Okay, so sometimes when you feel why God is not using us, uh, you know, in using someone else but not using you, then you need to realize that there is something that is impure in your life. You're not being that vessel of honor where God can um, uh, use you. Okay, uh, and uh, even as we become, you know, a journey in our Christian walk with God, we think we have witnessed, we are, you know, born again, we're going to heaven, uh, you know, and uh, we are already in ministry, we're doing ministries. And so we think that sin cannot come near us, you know, um, uh, but we need to be very careful that, you know, we can also get attracted to sin, sinful ways, um, and, uh, and at times we can begin to compromise, uh, we can, uh, you know, adjust to some sins, uh, which once we never used to tolerate. That's because we're not walking in line with God, we're not spending time with God, we're not letting His Word and the Holy Spirit correct us and uh, purify us. And we see eventually that our life will go on a downward uh, trail and become very, very uh, disastrous. So it's very important to guard our uh, passions. Uh, you know, we have different passions. Um, we need to guard that in, in a pure way uh, and maintain purity in that area. You know, uh, we need to um, fire up our passion for purity. Always keep that passion, the fire burning for purity in doing things in a pure way the next thing is in our personal life is we need to set some personal boundaries okay uh, psalm 101 verses 2 and 3 can somebody read that please Yes, uh, it would be nice if you can take the mic and read so that our students next time, okay, we can. Okay, so here the psalmist says that I will behave wisely. You know, we, we remember in chapter 2, we learned in, rece in uh, receiving God's guidance, we learned about David. We saw how David walked wisely in the Lord. Okay, he not only strengthened himself in the Lord, but also wi walked wisely. So he says, you know, the psalmist says, I will behave wisely. Look at what he says. When even when I walk within my house, I will walk with a perfect heart. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, we portray ourselves like angels in front of people, but it's only our family members who can tell us really whether we are angels or devils because, you know, of how they see us at home. Okay, our true nature is revealed at um, home. So, you know, uh, we need to walk perfectly before God, whether in the public or even in our home. Okay, for that, we need to set some boundaries. And Pastor here is writing his book. So he's written some boundaries. He says that he never meets a woman or counsels a woman alone. That's why if you come to APC office, we, you see our office has all, it's all open. You know, it has all glass uh, uh, separations uh, there's no closed doors uh, so anyone can see into anyone's cabin so even if pastor's talking to a lady he's uh, anyone can see because it's all open glass all four sides you know um, another boundary he sets is he never takes a woman alone in his car excepting his wife or you know his uh, his his daughter or his mother you know in the same vehicle he never gives a hug to women Okay, uh, he might just shake their hands, um, and also when he's praying for them, he does not lay hands on any other part of the body. Just maybe 
when he feels led, he will lay hands on his on their uh, woman's head. Okay, it's good to follow uh, these rules. It just keeps us uh, safe. These boundaries. Uh, I also, when I relate to to men, you know, um, I don't get uh, too friendly with them. See, over friendly with them, over talking, over friendly with uh, men of any age. You know, even if they uh, are much younger to me, they don't know my age because of how puny and small I look. They think I'm just, you know, in my twenties. But uh, they might misunderstand. But you know, even with people with yeah, boys, the young age, I never talk too much. I don't get too over friendly. I'm okay with the uh, women. Uh, men also, I don't hug and all of those things. Women. Uh, very rarely, but yes, sometimes I I just give them a hug. But it's good to maintain all of these um, boundaries. Okay, uh, it just helps. Also, we need to stay clean from all private sexual uh, sins. Paul says in First Corinthians, you know, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of anything here is talking in relationship with food but you know we know that our sexuality is designed by god but even though god it's designed by god there are certain parameters there's a boundary that he's laid we can't step out of those boundaries now once we become born again people we are in christian ministries we are pastors or whatever it does not make us angels we're still human. Uh, we're still open to sexual temptations and sexual passions, and that's why it's important that you know we, uh, you know, we surrender our sexual appetites, our minds, our sexual desires, everything to God. You know, keep it under God's control. Just like we, uh, you know, bring every thought captive to God, we also bring our sexual appetites under God's control. We know that our sexuality is um, something that is very private, but you. Know, you know, uh, this is an area where many men, great men and women of God have actually fallen in this area. So you and I are no exceptions to this case. So that's why it's very important that, um, you know, we maintain these boundaries. We don't compromise with the sin. Uh, we don't give in to pornography. Okay. Don't watch, uh, you know, uh, dirty uh, blue films dirty things that are easily available on google uh, youtube don't give a second look to things in the magazines nowadays newspapers you know uh, sometimes when i look at newspapers i think you know these women would have uh, pictures of themselves when they're fully nicely clad but they don't show them in in fully dressed up clothes they will always show them very uh, you know um, very with less less clothing uh, with much of their flesh or skin revealing and it's very very sad why do they do that it's basically those kind of newspapers sell right if you just have printed material no graphics nobody's interested in that material even if you look at the billboard signs you know just a simple um uh jeans ad or just a simple, um, uh, you know, perfume had will have sexual connotations in that. And it's so sad because that is what sells. But we are not supposed to give in to pornography, lustful thinking, even flirting with the opposite sex. You know, some pastors are married and the the, the congregation or you have a, you know, you're a pastor of a youth group or a, a team that is under your care. You have women. Who are part of your team you know and you know some of them can easily flirt whether it's a guy or a, a woman you know we flirt with others even though we are married or you already are going to engage to be married to somebody you know flirting that is also something that is wrong first corinthians 5 6 and galatians 5 9 says a little leaven uh, leavens up the whole entire lump just little yeast you know can you know, just create the fluffiness in the entire, entire, uh, you know, batter or the dough that is there. So, you know, just a little sin can actually impact our entire uh, lives. Okay, so we need to stay clean from all sexual sins. Um, you know, keep our bodies subject under subjection under the power of the Holy Spirit under God's word, and take the necessary steps that we need to. Uh, to overcome all of these uh, temptations. There's another point about masturbation in page number 24. Uh, you know, many of them struggle with this, um, uh, but, you know, it 
there is no personal stand from the from God's word. But you know what we view as a church is um, you know we don't want our bodies to be a slave of anything. Okay, First Corinthians chapter six verse twelve, Paul says, you know, uh, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of anything. So the question if is masturbation okay or is acceptable is not the question that we need to be asking. It's the question we need to ask is does it help us? It really does not help us. It just makes us enslaved to a habit and then it leads into bondage and then it leads into sin and hence it's good not to indulge in masturbation. Okay. So what we need to do is we need to declare that our body is for God. Our bodies are holy. It's a temple of the living God. Um, our body has nothing to do with sin or sexual immorality. Um, uh, but our body is for the uh, Lord. Okay. And, uh, you know, we need to pray and consecrate uh, our sexual parts of our being to God. Declare that all of my sexual desires and sexual appetites are holy and consecrated to the Lord. We also need to be accountable to God every moment. Uh, you know, uh, we need to be pleasing God in everything that we do, every moment of our life. Uh, you know, we need to live with this fear that we are going to give an account of our life to God one day. If we live with that fear, everything that we do in life, we will do it with that sense of accountability. But if we don't have that fear that, hey, I'm going to stand before God one day and give an account for my life, then we are not going to live with any sense of uh, accountability we are going to you know get into a lot of sin and you know also we need to know like joseph said you know how can i sin against god we need to know that when we sin who's watching us god is watching us okay um god was watching over us uh, he knows what are our motives why we are doing things uh, so even when sometimes we might be doing some good work but it can be out of a wrong motive. We need to know that God sees. People might say, oh, what a good person, how many good things he or she is doing. But we need, God is looking at our motives. Okay. And also we need to know that all the time we are full-time believers and full-time ministers. Whether we are serving God or not, we are not, we can't say, okay, I'm in part-time ministry, part-time, because we can't say I'm a part-time believer. We all are full-time believers in the same way, but also full-time ministers of God. So wherever we God has placed us, whether we are a teacher, we're a housewife, we're studying a Bible college, working in an office, you know, we are God's ministers in that place. We bring about God's kingdom, his rule, his reign, his kingdom activity, his kingdom presence in that place. We are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You're, you're priests. Whether you are a teacher, pastor, um, a pilot, or doctor, an engineer, or chef, or, you know, whatever you are, a mechanic, whatever, you know, your calling is that you are a priest, okay? And that is more important, and you need to live your life um, with that sense of uh, accountability, okay? And, um, you know, um, we need to, um, like Paul says, you know, we um, also need to work with our own hands, be diligent, be sincere uh, with what God has given to us. At the same time, also engage in uh, ministry. Okay. Uh, this, the next point, many of you might not think it's important, but it's very important. Watch your diet and exercise regularly. You know, don't overeat. Uh, don't keep on eating all the time eat don't eat a lot of junk food you know our bodies are the temple of the living god we are accountable to god even to what we are eating how we are taking care of our body how much rest we're giving exercise we need to exercise regularly okay uh, because if we don't you know if we don't eat right if we don't uh, exercise and we don't rest well what happens to our body we have a lot of sicknesses right and then we are not being good stewards of our body when you're not being good stewards of our body our health is not going to they're not healthy we cannot pursue the things of god we can't carry out the vision of god spiritually we won't be able to grow um 
So, you know, avoid overeating too much of sweets. Pastor saying that in his book, salt, <laughs> oily food, fatty food, uh, eat on time, you know, be very disciplined eating on time. You know, um, our eating habits and regular exercise will help us to serve God uh, better and longer. Okay. Uh, and also eating right, exercising right, resting well will also save time and money. Okay. What you spend in hospitals, medical care. Uh, so you can use that time and money for building the kingdom of God for more beneficial things. So be consistent in how you eat and rest and exercise. Okay. And the last thing is have a personal management plan. Okay. Um, you know, when Paul is writing to Timothy and to Titus, he's telling them, you know, I want you to choose elders or leaders in the church. And he says, he does not say, you know, if you read First Timothy, Second uh, Timothy chapter 1 and uh, Titus chapter 1, you see the whole list that Paul is giving Titus and Timothy. Titus, who is ministering at Ephesus and, uh, uh, sorry, Titus, who is ministering in Crete and Timothy, who is ministering in Ephesus. He tells them, choose leaders and he tells them what criteria. He does not say they should be reading the Bible, they should be godly, they should be attending church regularly, they should be flowing in the gifts of the Spirit, they should manifest the fruit of the Spirit. No, if you read that, you, you'll be shocked. You'll say, you'll see that he says there should be men of one wife, they should be able to take care of their children, they should uh, not uh, be given to jealousy, hatred, pride, uh, quarreling, not covetous, uh, they should not be strong-willed, um, you know, they should not be given to wine, quick-tempered, not violent, they should not be greedy for money, be hospitable, lovers of good, sober-minded, just, holy, self control Please read that, you know, First Timothy, um, Second Timothy chapter 1 and Titus chapter 1, you can see that list. So God is more interested, God is revealing to Paul, I'm more interested in every aspect of the life, not just in the, you know, manifesting the fruits of the Spirit or the gifts of the uh, Spirit, okay? So, um, you know, the Holy Spirit fills us with boldness and power and love and discipline and of self-control. We all know that verse in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, it says, For God has not given us a spirit of timidity or of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Okay, so that is the Holy Spirit that's giving uh, to us. He gives us a spirit of discipline and self-control. Um, so, you know, you need to plan your life uh, because Holy Spirit is a, a, and God is a God of order. You know, we already learned that, you know, so we need to also order up our lives. We need to plan our time. Uh, we need to, so that we can use our time and the resources that God has given uh, well. If we don't, plan our day, then, you know, something will come up, this will come up, that will come up, and we can get distracted and we can end up doing those things. And we will finally come to the end of the day and not achieve much because we have not completed what we wanted to do because we had not planned a day and we had just given in to all the distractions that um, came in. So distractions actually waste our time and our energy. It delays things. It weakens things for us. So how do we have a personal management plan? You know, have a daily schedule. Okay, what time you're going to get up, what time you're going to pray, what time you're going to do what, which assignment, classes, you know, all of those things. You know, uh, set your priorities right. You know, time with God, time with family, you know, time to exercise, rest, and your work. Okay? Um, sometimes when, you know, uh, People, you, you become very famous. People will invite you from all corners of India, from the world. But, you know, just don't be running here and there, everywhere. But take on ministry assignments or speaking engagements that really is going to benefit and help. Or is that area of ministry or anointing that God is leading you? Because there are other areas of ministry where other people can preach and teach in that same area. You needn't have to go. Uh, if you do that, you know, you will find yourself running from place to place and that will affect your time, your ministry, where God has called you to, your vision, your plan, and also your health. Okay? Meeting church people, 
you know, uh, as a pastor, you know, pastors traveling all over the place, meeting people. Uh, but what Pastor Ashish does is just to save his time, energy, he calls people to the office. So he knows that people that come to the office only when their situation is very, very important. They will spend the time, energy, take leave, everything and come and meet pastor. And pastor also saves his time and energy either from running from place to place. You know, in that time of two hours where he can meet only one person, he could meet at least three people because they're just coming there to office. He's not running from place to um, place. So just, you know, uh, decide on things, what you want to decide in your own ministry. He also doesn't go home visiting uh, for birthdays, dinners, special occasions, because such a big congregation, if he's going every time, every day, just imagine, you know, he'll be just doing that and not preparing for ministry and other areas of ministry will um, not be uh, fulfilled or God's plan will not uh, proceed, okay? Uh, solving problems and meeting needs, uh, we need to know that we are not God. We cannot solve everybody's problems. We can't meet everyone's needs. There's an extent that we can go. We can help them. To that extent, we can do it. If you're not able to help them, what do we do? We just assign them to show them to somebody else, ask them to reach out to this person, that person, this ministry, that ministry, and they can get the help. But sometimes being in ministry, we think we are God. We need to help people with everything and anything and that can also become distractions that can also become a stress for us that can also eat up into our time and then we can see that you know uh, the things of god cannot be pursued the vision of god cannot be pursued and the last thing is you know pastor uh, works in uh, he plans his life 10 years decades okay so we already spoken about this you know uh, just sit down, take a paper, ask the Holy Spirit what he wants you to do this season of the life in your life or in the next 10 years of your life. Just hear, uh, put down what all you think you want to do the next 10 years of your life. Just ask the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you what are the things he wants you to remove, what are the things he wants to rearrange, change your things, your plans, and just work around that. And you just see that, you know, Pastor says it's very beautiful because he has seen you know how God works in 10 years of his life. God, he's seen God fulfill his plans, his visions, the dreams that he has, what God has envisioned for him. And also he sees this 10 years as season uh, when God is preparing him for the next season of his life. Yes, Sean, can you please take this mic where you can come up in front and ask a question? Come quickly. Okay. Anyone has any questions uh, for this lesson? One of you can be uh, just helping out with the mic. So basically, Pastor Ashish's plan, this 10-year plan is like how um, we can take an example for the government, like how they have their own five-year plan to accomplish certain goals or things that they need to like improve the cities like that. Yes, so, yeah, the government yeah. also has their, uh, yeah. you know, their five years they are in uh, ministry. Yes, this is important to plan. That's the most important thing. Anyone has any questions? Any questions from our online students? Francis, you have a question? Anyone else has any question? Online students, any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, we'll move on to the second thing is family. Okay. Uh, it's important for us to balance our work or if you're in ministry, balance your ministry and your family life. Okay. Yes, Sean, take the mic. Yes, it's a repeated. Yeah. Yeah, we'll just quickly go through it because uh, you all are reading it, but the our online students are not reading. They're not doing any uh, assessment like you all are doing. And also the e-learning students are not doing the assessments. So there are different people at different levels. So we just have to go through it. But we'll go through it quickly, okay? Um, 
you know, sometimes as uh, ministers of God, we are counseling other families, we are getting people married, uh, we are counseling children, but the minister's own family, his own marriage uh, is sometimes uh, his own home uh, can go through a lot of trouble and difficulties because the pastor is constantly busy with other families, other homes, other marriages, other children, when their own life and their own family, their own homes, their own wives and children are struggling. Yes. Mike, please. Yeah. How can we manage our priorities? How can you manage your priorities? Good question. Your first priority is God, right? So now you're not in, involved in any ministry. Okay, so you have to prioritize your time with God. What time am I going to spend time reading with God? Okay, and then what is your next responsibility? Your next responsibility is you're, you're a student now. So you attend classes. Uh, so you say in the classes, I feel very sleepy. I feel very drowsy. So in the night, I'm not going to be looking at YouTube. I'm not going to be watching any movies. I'm not going to be watching any videos. I'm not going to be listening to any sermons in the night. I'm going to get good sleep. For me, I'm just saying, you know, for you, for you example, eight hours of sleep makes you fresh. So you make it a point that I'm going to sleep at this time, make sure you go to bed. And then, you know, uh, such and such a time, now you have classes after class, you're having your supernatural hour, fasting prayer. What are you going to do from 4 to, four to 8 or 9 till you go to bed? You know, if you're not going to plan, you can just sit and talk and play the guitar or sing or learn an instrument or, you know, um, uh, Okay, all that is important, learning an instrument, but you've not come here to learn an instrument, right? You've come here to learn God's word. So you want to say, okay, I've learned today about, uh, you know, my identity in Christ. So I'm going to look at the notes. I'm going to prepare. I'm going to read God's word. You know, uh, this teacher said this about this scripture. Let me look at it. You know, you're going back to the notes that you, the teachers have taught you. You just have three classes. You can just spend one hour just going through. It's actually building you up in the things of God. So maybe four to uh, four to five, you say four to five, I'm just going to rest. Maybe five to six, you need rest, right? Four to five, I'm going to rest. I'm going to sleep for some time. Uh, five to six, I'm going to play some game or I'm going to go for a walk because exercise is important. So you're just walking around the campus. And then, you know, from six to nine, I'm just going to spend time because I'm here in Bible study to study, to learn God's word. I'm not here to uh, just talk, uh, to sing, to learn music, to sing well, to lead worship. All that is important. But I'm here to learn God's word. Because learning an instrument, you can do it later. Singing, you can do it later. But you'll never get the time to go through all of these notes. So priority is that. First priority is God. Second priority is learning what you have been taught every day. The third priority is rest, which you're resting one hour, exercise, and then you go back to sleep uh, soon so that you can wake up in the morning, spend time with God. You're not sleepy in your class. Priority. See? So for me, sometimes my priority is misty, so I don't uh, go shopping. I hardly go shopping. I hardly go visiting anybody because I don't have the time. I just have this priority. Today I have to do this, 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 this. I have to do it. I have to finish it. So I don't have time to watch anything, do anything, sit around, chat, talk, go here, go there. It's, you know, you just have to get your work done. Because, you, you know, you don't get your work done. It just gets delayed and gets piled up. It becomes uh, a difficulty. Okay, good question. Does it help? Okay, Prince. Prince says, how to implement the plans that we make uh, cause? We come up with many plans but can't fulfill to complete them. Uh, yes, so what you need to do is you need to think about your plans in, maybe you can start in two years, three years, five years, or if you're going able to do 10 years, fine. In the next two years, what you want to do? Now, for just for example, we have all these Bible college students here. None of them are married. So the next two years, they... Some of them may be thinking, okay, in the next two years, I'm going to continue with second year and third year course. I'm going to be here. Okay. And then maybe if they're planning for the next five years, the same Bible college students can say, I'm going to be here for the next two years. Okay, two years of study. Then after that three years, what I'm going to do, it's time for me. It's a good age for me to get married. 
and then I want to get, uh, you know, be, you know, do this ministry. So, you know, uh, I'm just going to pray and wait upon God. And then may God, maybe God is leading them to go under another, to be trained under another man of God because they want more training. So they think about some options. They write down the options and they ask the Holy Spirit uh, to lead them and guide them. So there's basically for the Bible college students, their next, their plan for the next five years is logically thinking is completing their Bible college because they're young and they're in the right age getting married. But some of them thinking, I'm not going to get married because I need to get a job. I need to get financially stable, then get married. So that is out of the question. So then the next is where should we go and minister? Okay. So some of them will think, okay, I don't want to just minister. I want to be like Paul. I want to work and do ministry. So what is the area where I want to work? which is the place God is calling me, which is the ministry, which field he wants me to work. So we just logically think, write down our plans, and then we ask we ask the Holy Spirit uh, to lead us and guide us and show us. And so the Holy Spirit, through the inner witness of the Holy Spirit, uh, through the audible voice of the Holy Spirit, the inner voice of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit can re, uh, realign our plans and our agendas. So you can maybe plan for two years, three years, five years, so good enough 10 years you can do that uh, so did I answer your question how about daily schedules and plans ma'am yeah daily schedules and plans that's what I just explained to this uh, Bible college student I just told him what he needs to do he's a student here so get up in the morning uh, study I mean uh, God first so spend time with God then attend classes then after that you know the Bible college has fasting prayer supernatural hour and then you know four to five rest because your body is tired then I said five to six important for exercise then uh, from six to nine you're here to study to equip yourself in God's word so you know whatever basically less three lessons were taught three subjects were taught go through the notes go to bed early uh, so that you can wake up the next day and uh, you know early so that you can spend time with uh, God okay so now if Prince you are working then you know um, you get up in the morning spend time with God Prince, <laughs> you know you get up you spend time with God and then you um, you you know um, you go to your work okay you come back home, uh, you spend time with family if you're married because family is important. Uh, you have parents, sit with them, chat for some time, uh, then go for a walk because it's important. Half an hour walk every day is very good. That's what doctors suggest, brisk half an hour walk in the park. Then come back and maybe, you know, do some home chores, prepare for your next day, uh, have your family prayer time. And then have dinner together with your family. So you're spending more time with the family and and go to bed. So you got, you finished your time with God, you finished your work, you finished time with, uh, uh, you know, you've got time to exercise, time with your family, time to do your home chores, prepare for the next day, and you're ready for the next day. Okay. Prince is one of our students here, not online students, he's our in person students. And so that's why we are laughing. Okay. So we'll move on to good questions. Our next lesson is uh, family. Okay, we already began that. Um, you know, uh, Paul tells uh, Timothy and Titus who he needs to choose as leaders of the church. He says, choose somebody who's able to take care of his own house. If somebody is not able to take care of his own house, that means his own wife and children, how can he take care of the house of God? You first take care of your own family. So somebody who's able to take care of their own family, and then, you know, he's able to take care of the church of uh, God. Okay? So it's very important. So actually, people, uh, you know, do this. Ministers of God. Ministry first, God second, family last. Or it's ministry first, uh, God second, uh, or it's ministry first, people in the in the church second, Third is God, and family doesn't figure out anywhere in the list. But the actual right order is God first, family second, ministry third. God first, family second, ministry third. And that is why we see many 
uh, pastors, their own families are in a breakup, their children are gone astray, away from God, they hate God, have anything to do with the church because they have seen their father not giving time to them. So why do we need God if this is going to happen to our family? And wives are not feeling that love, that understanding, the time with their husband, they're looking for love somewhere else. Okay. So, uh, yes, Sean, please take the mic. Come up in front. So in that scenario, wouldn't it be best that they work and then preach like on Saturday and Sunday or something like that, since that would like give them enough time for to spend their family also and to minister? Okay, Sean, because there are many men who work nowadays, the work system is so demanding that people have no time for family also. Leave alone people full-time ministry, working, you know, serving God full-time. People even working in the corporate or in the, you know, any field, uh, their work hours are long, maybe eight to eight in the night. So when, when uh, you know, some families uh, have heard, you know, uh, wives telling me that, uh, you know, when the husband comes back home, the children are already asleep. When the children leave home, the husband is still sleeping. See? Because... They have to earn and they think they have to do it for their family, but it's no, it's just eating up their family uh, time. So if you want to balance work, ministry and family, then you need to really be, you know, have a good management plan and ask God to help you. Okay. On page number 36, there are three postures, you know, that, uh, you know, is mentioned in the Bible. One is in Luke chapter 14. Uh, where Jesus says, if anyone comes to me, but he does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brother and sister, he cannot be my disciple. So one posture, it says in the Bible that we have to hate our mother, father, brother, sister, leave everybody and follow God. The second one, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he says that um, even those who have wives should be as though they had none. The second thing is, second stand is, the Bible says, those who have a married, you know, they should pretend as if to say they are not married. They should be busy doing God's work or working. Okay. Uh, there should be people like as though they don't have any wives. The third thing, uh, the third stand or third posture is 1 Timothy chapter 3, where it says that, you know, um, a, a, a leader or a church or a church elder should take care of his own wife and his children. So the whole question is, which stand should I take? You know, should I be a disciple of Jesus and forget about my father, mother, brother, sister, wife, children, everybody? Or the second one is be married, but pretend as if to say you're not married. That means don't be, you know, engaged in taking care of your wife and your other son. Be totally engaged in working for God and or doing your personal Work. The third thing is, you know, take care of your wife and children. So which is the right position to take? So people have raised up this question. Actually, okay, we need to fulfill all of these three simultaneously together. Okay, which means uh, our love for God should be over or supersede our love for our wife and children and all earthly relationships. And when God calls us, you must be willing to make sacrifices and not excuses saying that, God, you know, I can't go to the mission field because I have my wife and uh, children and, uh, you know, or I want to get married, you know, whatever. Okay, so the first thing is our love for God should supersede our love for our wife and children and earthly relationships. So when God calls us, we need to be willing to make sacrifices. The second thing is, even though we are married, okay, our focus should be on Christ, fulfilling, while fulfilling our family responsibilities, we must also fulfill what God has called us. We should not be distracted with just taking care of our family. Okay. Uh, and the third thing is we need to do our part in growing and nurturing our family and God will be glorified. Okay. So all three work simultaneously to Together. So when God is calling us for full-time ministry, we don't make an excuse saying our family. Okay. I can't make an excuse saying, God, I can't go to Bible college because my father didn't want me to go to 
Bible college. So that was not the time my father wanted me to go to Bible college. I had to go to Bible college, but God took care of, you know, making my father understand. Okay, so God first, family second. At the same time, you know, we, uh, we, we do God's work, but we also at the same time are taking care of our family. It's not that only family and not God's work. Okay, and the third thing is, you know, we need to do our part in growing and nurturing our family and God will be glorified. Okay, uh, we also need to nurture our relationship with our spouse. You know, sometimes pastors, ministers, they're so busy ministering to XYZ or ABCD, EFG, HIJ, KLM and all the people that come to them, but they neglect their own spouse. They don't have time to speak to their own family, their own children. They just think their own spouses will take care of things automatically. Uh, but it's God-given responsibility for you, husband and wife, to take care of each other, to nourish, cherish, uh, and to help your uh, spouse. Just as we are taking care of other people, we are equally responsible to giving our time, care, affection for our own family. Uh, and our own wife and our own children. Also important to nurture your relationships with your children. Um, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4. Can somebody use the mic and read it loudly? Where's the mic? Okay, you can read that. And you, and you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Thank you. Sometimes ministers or pastors think, that we should be busy doing God's work. It's the responsibility of the wife. Or if the husband is working in a, a software company or he's in, in, a, in a big, uh, you know, very busy job, he thinks it's not his responsibility to look after the children. It's the wife's responsibility to look after the children. Sometimes uh, ministers also think that it is the responsibility of the church, okay, to spiritually nourish their children. Sometimes parents think it's the responsibility of the Sunday school teacher to teach and nourish the child in the spiritual things. Just like they say, they think, nowadays parents tell the teachers that, you know, please don't give our children homework. It's your responsibility. We are paying fees. It's your responsibility to teach our children in school. Don't send them homework and all at home because we don't have time to take care. We are paying so much of fees. Your responsibility get done everything with the children in the school and the same way parents think you know that it's a responsibility of the church the sunday school teacher so send the children to sunday school it's their responsibility to nurture them spiritually but how many hours a child is spending in children's church or sunday school one hour okay in that singing everything half an hour only god's word it's actually the responsibility of the Parents, because in the Old Testament, it also says, we look at it, okay? It's important that we are able to train up our children in the ways of the uh, Lord. We just don't tell children what they should be doing and what they should not be doing because children don't listen. Only when you have a relationship with them, you know, children will listen to you because they know okay my father or my mother genuinely understands you know um, uh, is spending time you know uh, having a relationship you know we need to spend a relationship uh, build time uh, building a relationship with our children when we build a relationship with our own children when we teach them or we think tell them something from god's word then they are going to Listen, because they're not thinking my father and mother is just like a policeman or a policeman, woman, just telling me what to do and what not to do. But they know that they're genuinely interested because you're interested. In, hey, what are you doing? Come, you like to play badminton? I'll play badminton with you. You like to play um, your painting? I'll also sit along with you and paint. Or they're playing a game? You just sit with them and play a game. They're watching Cartoon Network. Just sit with them and watching watch Cartoon Network. Talk to them. So they basically thinking my parents are genuinely interested in what I am doing. So when you're telling them, you're correcting them, you're teaching them something from God's word, they will listen to you. Or they will think, oh, there is somebody who is really like a pastor, a preacher, just telling me what to do, what not to do, and not interested. Okay. The next thing is we need to work to provide for our family. Can somebody use the mic, please? Rin, can you take the mic and read First Timothy chapter 5, verse 8? On page number 39. 
But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. These are very strong words that Paul uses. He says, if anyone does not provide for his own family, especially for his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Okay, so sometimes, you know, a minister's children, you know, they uh, they hate ministry or they hate church or they hate God because they think because their parents are in ministry has separated them. Some of them have been put into boarding schools, mission boarding schools. Okay, so they hate God. They have nothing to do with God. I've seen many missionary children like that because they cannot stay with their parents. Why? Because their parents can't afford them. Okay, and they hate God, they hate anything to do with God or spiritual things because they think God cannot provide for them. So Paul is saying, you know, you need to provide. So if ministry is not giving you that kind of money where you're able to feed your uh, spouse and your children and take care of their needs, then it's okay to get a small job. It's not sinful. But take a small job, you know, do a job. At the same time, you can also minister. You can run your church. You can, you know, preach on Sundays. At the same time, you can work. Th that way, you can actually, you know, feed your children, you know, feed your spouse and see that they are not lacking uh, in any which way. So it's not sinful if you take up a job. It's not uh, like, you know, Jesus says, you're looking back at the plow. It's not a sign of unbelief. No. It's just that you are earning so that your family is not deprived of their basic needs. Okay. Pursue God's purpose as an uh, individual. Okay. Uh, Matthew chapter 10. Can, um, uh, can somebody read that? Matthew chapter 10. Rin, can you pass that mic to somebody quickly? Matthew chapter 10 verses 37 and 38. Francis. Put on the mic and read. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37 and 38. He who loves father and father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Okay, so here this verse seems to be a contradiction to what we have actually, a sudden shift from what we have been saying uh, so far. Yes or no? No, we've been placing influence on taking care of our family. Uh, but here it says, you know, those who love their father or mother is not worthy of me or loves their sons and daughters more than me is not worthy of me. But here actually is saying that it's important to take care of the family. But uh, we cannot compromise our call, our love for God, our obedience for God for the sake of our family. Okay, so if, uh, you know, if um, uh, you're, you know, you're financially stable and you work hard and then you want to go into ministry uh, and you know, your wife knows that, you know, or, or your husband knows that if you step into ministry, then that income will not come. You might not be able to go abroad for holidays or you might not be able to uh, buy a bigger house or a bigger car that you were planning to uh, because the sudden call of God has come into your life and you feel that this is the time to take and you take on that call because you feel that your children are, okay, you have some bank balance to take care of your children's education you can go ahead with your ministry but your wife or your spouse says you know don't do that you know if you do that we cannot buy a bigger house or we cannot uh, buy a bigger car or we cannot you know uh, go out and eat or uh, in restaurants or we can't go for holidays or anything so don't pursue that call well that is when we don't pursue God's call in those times when we just want to you know feed our greed and not just our needs then it's making a compromise yes we need to take care of our family but also at the same time we don't compromise on our love for god and obedience to his call okay uh, we walk ahead with god's uh, plan and purposes for our life in kiss in christian ministry at the same time you know, we take care of our, our spouses, our parents, our children. Uh, and we see that, you know, all of these roles are interlinked. Each role strengthens the other. Okay. Uh, for example, success in one area is success in another area. So if our wife and our children are happy, our home is happy, our minds are free, we can go and minister. Okay. Uh, and there's success in that area. If our wives and children are not happy, there's problem at home, you know, we cannot be successful in the area of our uh, ministry. 
Okay, so we'll stop here. Uh, anyone has any questions? Yes, Sean, please take the mic and you can ask your question. Uh, another thing I wanted to add about like why sometimes... Is it on? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, another reason why um, I think children become rebellious, you know, when uh, when they're, you know, especially like pastors' children, is because it's not. Uh, maybe it can be like more, not getting much attention. Another extreme is that they give too much attention on uh, forcing them to read the Bible and the Word, and not giving them like much freedom. I think that's another thing that you need to take take into account. Yeah, that's very true. We'll come to that where it says. You know, as uh, don't use every uh, opportunity to preach a sermon to your wife or to your children, you know, or don't use every opportunity to take you use Bible chapter and verse to tell your wife and children, you know, what to do. That is the worst thing to do, especially when you're having a disagreement and an argument. You know, don't over spiritualize. Don't bring Bible verse chapter. Tell them because that would totally put off a person. OK, yes, not. Teaching children also can lead them astray. Overemphasizing being over strict can also get them away from God. That's why he said it's important to have a relationship. When you do everything in a context of a relationship, the person understands your motives and why you're doing what you are doing. Okay? Relationship is important. That's why build a relationship with somebody, you can get them to do whatever you want. Okay? Okay, we'll stop here. Uh, any questions from our online students? Yes, Chira, you can take that mic. Prince uh, Vidya Deep, you have any question? You can type it in the chat. Is it okay to not get married? Is it okay? To not get married. It's okay not to get married? Yes, it is okay not to get married because Paul says, uh, you know, those who are uh, in, in one of these verses here, it says, Paul says, it's okay for you not to get married because when you're not married, it actually helps you to, um, you know, um, take care of God's, you know, work even more, you know, because you don't have this responsibility. First Corinthians chapter seven, verses twenty-nine to thirty-five says, uh, "He who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife." Uh, I'm personally unmarried, so it gives me a lot of time to do ministry because uh, there's no responsibility of a spouse and a, uh, and, uh, and children. You just have your parents. Most of the time, they're doing things for us <laughs> still. Okay. Okay, good question. Anyone else has any other questions? But I think uh, calling to be unmarried is a call from God. Yes. He gives you the grace. If you're not called to be, a, not, if you're not called to be married, or unmarried, then if you pursue that, then you won't get that grace. Chira, you're planning not to get married? <laughs> okay, thank you everyone for joining class. Uh, I hope um, online students, no questions. Okay, if there's no questions, we'll end class. Thank you, everybody. Have a blessed weekend. Uh, God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Prince. <laughs>